My dearly beloved in Christ, you have heard the old saying that a picture is worth a thousand year, a thousand words. We could also say that a story is worth many, many lessons without a story. It really drives home the point. And so when this man asked our Lord, who is my neighbor? Our Lord didn't answer directly. He told the story, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And then he asked the man, so who, in your opinion, was the neighbor to the man that fell among robbers? And so this story really drove home the lesson of charity, the obligation of charity towards anyone in need. Now our Lord begins by saying that a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And in fact, Jericho is the lowest city in the world, well below sea level, whereas Jerusalem is in the mountains. And so there is quite a descent traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho. But also there is quite a stretch there where there are no villages, no cities, no towns. And so you could see that robbers could hide out and waylay a poor traveler and rob him and beat him as they did to this poor man. Now, usually, when we reflect upon this story, we reflect upon the Good Samaritan, who was being a Samaritan means he was from Samaria. Now, Samaria is geographically was the area that lay between Jerusalem, Judea, and Galilee in the northern part of the Holy Land. And it was an area where there was uh, schismatic worship. The Samaritans had built themselves a temple, which was strictly forbidden. And so they had instituted a schismatic worship. And because of that, the Jews wouldn't even talk to them. They avoided them like the plague. And is it not interesting that the only man who showed compassion and pity to the poor traveler who had been beaten and left in the ditch was a Samaritan, a foreigner. At any rate, most of the time we concentrate when we reflect upon this parable on the Samaritan and his charity. What a lesson for us. But this morning, let us, pat, let us reflect upon the sad fact that there were two men who saw the man who had been beaten and passed on. One, sad to say, was a priest, and the other was a Levite. Now, a Levite was a member of the tribe of Levi, and they were given special privileges, special honor, because the Levites had not participated You recall when Moses went up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, how the people had built a golden calf and were worshiping it. The Levites had no participation in that sin of idolatry. And so they were given, again, special privileges, and they also helped the priests in their role of offering sacrifices. Now, the priests were descendants of Aaron. Aaron was the brother of Moses and was the the first high priest. And so his descendants were the priests and they would offer the sacrifices. So every priest was a member of the tribe of Levi, a Levite, but not every Levite was a priest. But how sad of all the people that passed by that there was a priest and a Levite. And this shows us in what a sad state the priesthood was at the time of our Lord, the priesthood of the Old Testament. In fact, we find that our Lord was continually challenged and questioned and attacked by the leaders and the priests of the people. We often hear terms, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians and the scribes. So what what do we mean by these different names? Something akin to what we might be used to as political parties, different factions among the leaders, the priests and the leaders of the people. The Pharisees were a group that originated about a hundred years before Christ 
at the conclusion of the Maccabean period when the Jews had been persecuted for their religion. So the Pharisees became zealous for the law, but they also added their own customs and their own interpretation, and they laid even heavier burdens upon the people. And sadly, they got to the point where for them, their entire religion was involved with externals. They left off completely the importance of the heart, the internal. And they prided themselves on their punctilious observance of the law. But they were orthodox. They were not given to any heresies. The Sadducees, on the other hand, were a group who had denied the resurrection of the body. And so they were in heresy because that was revealed even in the Old Testament. The Herodians, finally, were a group who favored Roman rule, and so they supported Herod, the king, and in general, the Roman rule and paying taxes to the Roman government. So you had these groups, and you also have the men who were called scribes. The scribes were the lawyers. In fact, the man who asked our Lord the question in today's gospel, it says a certain lawyer asked him this question, so he would have been a, he would have been a scribe. And the scribes were those who knew the law inside and out. They read the scriptures of the Old Testament over and over and tried to learn it, to memorize it. If someone had a question, he would go to a scribe and say, what does the law require? And they knew the scriptures. But these men, these Pharisees and Sadducees and Herodians and scribes, instead of accepting our Lord when he came, for the most part, they resisted and were envious of him and even sought his downfall. And many of them, again, were priests. How sad, once again, that a priest would pass by and a Levite would pass by. You can imagine the state of the people at that time if their priests were so lacking in good example and living the religion of the Old Testament. What was the state of the people? Because it has often been said that as the priest, so the people. And I've even read it differently in one book, a wonderful book called The Soul of the Apostolate by Dom Chattard. And he gives an axiom that goes like this. If you have a saintly priest, you will have a holy people. If you have a holy priest, you have a good people. If you have a good priest, you have a mediocre people. And if you have a a mediocre priest, you have a bad people. In other words, he says, not every individual, but by and large, a parish will be one step below what a priest aspires to be. So priests take for our model, St. John Marie Vianney. And what you notice in St. John Marie Vianney was not only his personal penance and prayer, and the fact that he spent so many hours in the confessional, but also that he completely changed the Christian living of the people of ours. It was a small town, and when he got there as the pastor, even though everyone in the village was baptized, was nominally a Catholic, just a handful of people went to Mass on Sunday. The practice of the faith had so completely fallen down as a result of the French Revolution some 20, 30 years before. And he began by prayer and penance and his preaching, and gradually people began to come to Mass, and over time, by degrees, not all at once, he completely transformed the religious tenor of that village to such a point that he succeeded in closing down all the taverns in the village, which were occasions of sin, And he fought a relentless war against dancing and some of the uh, celebrations of the young people in the village. And again, completely changed the villagers. This was noticed by visitors to ours. In fact, in the book on the life of St. John Marie Vianney, there was once a visitor who thought that the people overdid it. And he went up to one of the villagers and he says, your pastor is going to turn you all into monks. And instead of the man being offended, he said, we have to strive to live good Catholic lives because our pastor is a saint. That was his response. So St. John Rivieni elevated 
the, the living, the Catholic living of the people of the village because of his saintliness, his holiness. Another example that I read about that I'd like to share with you was a priest who became pastor of a little village in northwestern France called pont Main. And I became aware of this because when I was in northern France a few years ago, I wanted to visit that apparition in pont Main and learn about it. And when I went there, approaching the village, driving towards the village, I began to notice all of these shrines, um, crucifixion scenes outside of people's homes, very different from the rest of the of the landscape when you arrive at that village and you see all these shrines. And when we went to the shrine, we went to the visitor center and they showed a video that tells the story of Our Lady's apparition in Jan uh, January of 1871 during what was called the Franco-Prussian War. And the Prussians had won victory after victory and laid siege to Paris. But when they came close to Pont Main, our Lady appeared there on January 17, 1871, and said to the children, Pray, my children. Actually, she didn't speak. It was on a scroll in the sky under her. Said, Pray, my children. And she said, My son allows himself to be touched, to be moved by your prayers. And Our Lady was only seen by four children. The adults could not see, see her. Two boys and two girls. It's interesting that both of the boys became priests, one of the girls became a nun, and the other girl remained single and became a housekeeper for a priest. At any rate, why did Our Lady choose that village? Oh, and by the way, the war with Prussia ended right after that apparition. The armistice was signed and the, the Prussians just withdrew. But why did she choose that village? So I learned in the visitor center who the pastor was at the time of that apparition, and he had become the pastor some 10 or 12 years before. And the first thing he did was to enroll every single parishioner in the village, every single villager there, in the confraternity of Our Lady of Victories, which has to do with a shrine of Our Lady in Paris. And he promoted the rosary and got to the point where every family in the village prayed the rosary together every day. And he also improved the uh, life of the people. He, he organized the people to repair their roads and did other physical improvements in the village. But above all, he was very devout to Our Lady. He promoted devotion to Our Lady so much that every day when he said Mass, there were four candles on the side altar of Our Lady. And he lit those four candles every day during Mass to promote devotion and because of his own devotion to Our Lady. And it's interesting, when Our Lady appeared, she was in an oval, and there were four candles lit, two on each side of her, showing her appreciation for that act of devotion. But in the course of, of watching this, this video explanation of the shrine of the apparition, it told a story, it inter there was an interview of a man who was in his mid-80s, and this was made some 20 years ago, so the man was, you know, alive early in the 20th century. And he said, when he was a boy, he remembers his father, before they had a tractor, walking behind the horse, plowing the field, with his hand on the plow, and in one hand, he held a rosary. And there he was, plowing the field, praying the rosary, taking the opportunity to pray extra rosaries when he could. And that just really edified me, surprised me, that here is a simple farmer, villager, who prayed the rosary so frequently, so often during the day. And of course, they prayed their family rosary. So you can see why Our Lady would have chosen that village for this apparition. But it also brings out the effect that a zealous pastor can have for the people. And we, priests, must strive to imitate these ideals of Catholic priests. And you should remember to pray for your priests. And think about it this way. The more your priests fulfill their duties, the better off you are. The more they help you. And so it's really like praying for yourself when you pray for priests. But sadly, when Vatican II came, how many of the priests just went along with the changes? How many of the priests compromised what they knew was wrong? 
because perhaps they didn't live their priesthood as they should have. So when we reflect upon this parable of the Good Samaritan, the wonderful example given us by the Samaritan who was a foreigner, let us also recall the sad part that this poor man who had been beaten was passed by by a priest and by a Levite. Let us pray that all of our traditional priests will become like the Curie of ours, like the pastor of Pont Maine. Imitate that example and let all of us imitate the Good Samaritan to practice charity towards anyone in need according to our ability and the need of the person to whom we practice that charity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.